And what's your working process like? I mean, do do you thrive on deadlines, or do you? <laughs> I so rarely get the chance to talk to another. No, person. no, exactly. Uh, really interesting. Well, deadlines. I mean, as well, Douglas Adams used to say he enjoyed deadlines. He used to enjoy the sound of the whooshing sound as they went past. Um, <laughs> I'm not one of those, though. I mean, I, I'm. Um, I, I, I live in fear of deadlines, like I suspect most people do. Um, I get frustrated that uh, I am not more efficient in the earlier stages of working towards a deadline. And I think it's it's very true that there is a long period of denial. Um, leading up to, yes, we both know what we mean, don't we? Um, <laughs> there's a long period of denial uh, before any, what feels like any serious or productive work. But do you not think that the work is happening, in fact, that uh, something is happening? Because uh, then it yeah. all happens so quickly towards the end. It, it does. Um, I'm crying. Yes, yeah, it's all the work while crying, yes. <laughs> and you've seen that in me. Um, I, yes, I'd, I'd like to, to believe that, and um, it's different for different projects, isn't it? Because I think if the if the goal uh, is quite clear or reasonably clear about what the end result of something should be, then of course that makes it a lot easier. It's worse when you're just fumbling around and you don't even you can't see what the end yeah. target is. It's like that's really difficult. It's very frightening, and but but I think fear is, is and adrenaline. It's, it's very important to me. I I almost need to leave it until it's too late really to write the piece and, and then it's it's just terrifying you know because the deadline's there and you, and you have to meet it and 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 there's always that that, that feeling that it's not going to be good enough as well and how, and what will people say and you start imagining the, the what the reactions of, of the listener of the performers and and you get totally self-conscious and in the end, I, I have this maxim, which I, I tend to revert to, which is just write rubbish. Yes. Because in the end, that's all you can do, you know, and, and, and not care if it's rubbish. And then, of course, that loosens yes. up the process and you just start throwing the notes onto the page. Yes. And then at least you have something to work with. Yes, the thing about writing rubbish, um, it's something even that uh, it's supposed to be quite a good, a deliberate thing to do. So uh, deliberately writing rubbish. <laughs> uh, is something that I've sometimes resorted to. Um, and the interesting thing about it, the reason why it works, is that it sort of forces you to confront uh, the question, of what do you mean by rubbish? What, what is rubbish in one's own context? Why is it rubbish? Why do you dismiss it? And what that seems to do is just break down a few uh, inbuilt assumptions that you have about what makes bad music. That certainly happened to me a couple of occasions. But it takes a certain amount of, it takes a certain state of bloody mindedness, I think, to, to just force yourself to do that. And I have done that. Uh, and I'm not saying that any necessarily durable, productive work has come out of you know, the end result of that session, but what it has done is freed me up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it, it frees you up and then yeah. and it gets rid of those voices. Yeah. Um, because you, you've decided yourself that you actually don't care. And, yeah. And then, yeah, and then you get beyond those critical voices and you just. I think start to respond more directly to what's what's in there and what's what needs to come out. Yes. And if you make value judgments on that, it, it's it's stifling. You can't. You, you you just have to be true and honest. Yes. And what you're hearing in your head, and you have to get it onto the page. And it's no good saying, "Well, is it any good?" Before I write it down. Mm. If it's there, it needs to be written down. They do say, don't they, that the creative act is a, is a two-pronged approach. There's the um, there's the creation, and then there's the culling. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think somebody summed it up, there's another way of saying it, um, aggregate drunk, curate sober. So actually adopt a, a rather reckless approach to the, to the act of just cr generating loads of material. Yeah. Suspend your, your um, tendency to, to edit and to be a perfectionist and to change things. Just get the material down first yeah. and then the, it's a separate mindset. To yes, and, and, then, and then you, you come back in. And I think I heard John Cleese talking about that, and that that, that necessary period of playfulness, mm -hmm. when you're not judging anything, but you're just really enjoying whatever happens. Yes, yes. That's. Uh, uh, do you find that you have certain strategies to cope with uh, uh, habits of procrastination? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, we were talking about my. Um, Discovery of the Pomodoro. Oh yes, it? which oh, is a complete revelation to me. I, I've, I've already tried it this Today, morning. The first I tried time. it this morning, and so all of a sudden I just got some, some work done. It's amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. I mean, it's, it's basically just just limiting yourself to 25 minute spans, which is, I think, the, 
meant to be the optimum amount of time that you can really concentrate. And, and setting a timer and turning everything else off are not so good at that. But you have, and you have a specific, uh, you, you do a set number, you do eight of them a day. I right? do eight because I always used to do four hour working periods when, when my children were little. I had four hours a day child care, which I was paying for, and that was a real um, incentive to get some notes onto the page. And then when I didn't need that anymore, I, I've been floating in sort of free fall ever since, you know, really unable to pin myself down. It's been pathological, you know. And, and starting work sort of at seven in the evening because you know, no kids coming home from school, nobody needing anything cooked for them. And so I was just sort of get on with other things during the day and keep putting it off and putting it off. And this system is really good because I know I've got to do eight. And, and the other end of it is if you've done eight, then you can stop. And the, and the principle also from what you were saying yesterday is that the, within those 25 minute periods, it's vital that you have uh, predetermined and agreed with yourself what you're actually going to attempt to achieve in that 25. So it's, it's a sort of a, a specific focus. You are going to do eight bars or you are going to do yeah. the flute part. Or yeah, so you're going to, yeah, you're just going to, well, you're going to do the dynamics in this section or, yeah. or whatever. And, uh, dynamics are difficult, aren't they? Uh, yes. Hate putting in dynamics. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I try and do it and I go along, but it doesn't always work. No, yeah. I mean, in theory, you should be hearing all the dynamics, yes. you're right, but it doesn't really work like that, particularly if you're balancing a big score. Yeah. Uh, yes. A lot of my work has been around words, and sometimes my own words. So, uh, for instance, if I'm working on a text for, for setting in, in some context, I can spend far too long of my allotted time for that commission working on the text and then think, oh my goodness, you know, I've spent three months on the text, I've only got two months left of the music, <laughs> but I find that the music's there, you mm. know, because without realising it, in thinking thinking of the words, I've, I've been creating the music at the same time, and it's, it's, it's sort of like an alchemy, really. It um, touches on something that we were talking about over lunch uh, yesterday, um, the, the process of composition that is, um, that is taught, I think, by John Corriano, but um, it's been taken up by a number of his students, I think, Nick and Ruby's one of them, um, Eric Whittaker's another, there are several. Um, the, the notion that you, you compose actually by, in the initial stages, not writing any music at all, but you, you draw uh, overviews and you draw, uh, you might, or you might even just write text, you might, you might just write some words that are some very broad and loose descriptions about what it is you want to do, mm -hmm. even in loose terms. So you might literally just start with, it's a three movement piece. That could be your first line, it is a piece of three movements. Um, so almost like you it's like a camera that's just zoomed out on the whole thing. It's before you've written any music. And then gradually the process of writing something, still without writing any actual notes, but, but zooming in on each thing and thinking, even if you just draw some graphs or some some lines or you know, maybe a hairpin to show something getting louder or whatever. And then gradually you do this in more and more and more and more detail uh, until you've got this massive overview of what the thing's about. And only then do you, is your brain in a sort of a, a position to, to to know what the what the musical material is yeah, that I fits think, all of this? I think that's great. I've found often, <laughs> too often I get asked for the programme note before I've started the piece because I'm so late on all my deadlines. And so I'm, I'm getting the phone call about the you know, have you done have you done the programme note yet? And so I have to write a programme note and describe the piece before I've written it. And that's fantastic, because then I have the template. But you've never felt, have you ever felt sort of too subscribed sort of, sort of by that? I mean, you've never well, felt once, I, I, it was a string quartet, and, and I wrote in the programme note, this was written on the Isle of Harris, because I had this idea that I was going to go up to Harris and, and write this piece. And I then and had, you lied. Uh, <laughs> well, I then had to go to Harris. Oh, right, to did you go? Oh, right. Oh, and I only had a week. Um, to, to be in Harris and write the piece, and so I wrote it incredibly quickly, but I wrote it in Harris because I had to follow this programme. That is brilliant. <laughs> I just, uh, uh, so actually, it's a whole new way of composing. This yeah. piece was written on the Maldive Islands. I can just see it now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and the other thing you can do is, 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 is write a couple of really fantastic reviews of the piece as well. You write, so you write yes. the programme, and then you write these reviews that say, the use of the strings was absolutely <laughs> exquisite. You know? And you start hearing this amazing piece. And yeah. it's, it's, like the, it's like the reverse of the, of the nasty voice on your shoulders saying it's rubbish. You know, it's, yes. it's the absolute reverse. So you, you think of all these positive descriptions of the piece of music. And I, I find that very helpful. That is great. I, I'm going to have to try that myself. That's uh, <laughs> brilliant.